that was not a very wise thing to do. Hey everyone, it's Hugh Sweeney here and I'm back again with another video. Today I'm in this sort of natural scrubland. Well, I'm not in it, I'm, I'm on the road beside it. And it's an area where I frequent for a little bit of bird photography. It can be good some days, it can be bad other days. A little bit hit and miss like myself. And I'm here with the Canon R5 and this new lens I got for it, which is the Canon RF 800 f11 lens. Now this lens has a major flaw. It's got a fixed aperture at f11. So it's very limited and it's quite costly considering that it's such a small aperture. But it has a big trick up its sleeve and it has a few what I call redeeming features and I'm gonna explain that in this video. Now what happened there was I had a lot of tree cover and I had only a very brief half a second where the bird flew between trees and did I capture it? Did I get a sharp shot? And I think, I think I did. If I had the EOS R with me, I would not have got that shot. Quite a few gold coming in. So we have a big flock of curlew. I'm at one sixteen hundredth of a second there, and that's sort of a bare minimum shutter speed for birds in flight. At that shutter speed there, I got away with 1600 ISO, which is quite acceptable. So now I'm hearing the sound of long tail tits. We have a little flock of them feeding somewhere. I can hear them here. I just can't see them. But the light has gone very dull and it's also beginning to rain a little bit. So one thing I gotta watch when I'm out with this bad boy is the rain. Just don't get it wet. It's not weatherproof in any way. Despite the threat of showers, things remained fairly dry. So I took a spin to a nearby estuary where there's always plenty of seabirds, absolutely perfect for trying out the RF 800. When the RF 800 lens was released last year, it was received with mixed feelings from the wildlife photography community. Who would be the main users of a lens like this? An F11 aperture and lack of any weather sealing is pretty much everything you don't want in a wildlife zoom lens. So it's not surprising that a lot of bird and animal shooters had little positive to say about it. But it's a lens that left a few of us quite curious. So I got one. Okay, so I see a egret over here and it's a little bit too far away to get a decent photograph. So I may try and sneak up on it. Now, when you're along here, you're along the road. Birds are used to people on the road. If I go over the edge, straight away, the bird is gonna evacuate. So I have to sort of stick to the road. But what I'm gonna do is try and get closer, walk down here, then dip behind the grass and see if the bird comes to me as it hunts. Now it's kind of into the light, but that might work in my favor. Should the egret be sort of back at it? Come on, go for something. 
Mist. Bummer. The RF-800 lens has a fairly lightweight build for a Canon lens. The textured finish is a little bit plasticky for my liking, but in a way it needs to feel like that to keep the weight down. This is quite a light lens for an 800. Though I think the build is adequate, one would expect not to have visible seams in the finish with a lens that costs over a grand. Oh, that's a missile thrush. Now one thing I've noticed about the R5 and the 800 lens, because the stability is so good, you find yourself recording a lot of handheld video, because you can. If you're not doing too much panning and tilting, you can get really good steady shots handheld. And when you couple in the fact that you might be filming in 120 frames per second, which I am, that means you're gonna get really steady footage. Use the flippy screen this time. I'd really like a clean shot of a red wing. Though I tried a few shots of the red wing, it was about 30 meters away and because it was in the grass, both the tracking and the single point focus struggled to get a sharp shot. But when the red wing popped up onto a branch, boom, that animal auto tracking focus kicked in and I got a nice crisp shot. Bird photography in the outdoors definitely gives you an appetite, so after that it was time for a tea break. The RF800 lens from Canon, it's a prime lens, and usually prime lenses don't move a lot, but this one does. When you take it out of the bag, you have to open it up like that and then lock it like that. Okay, so it means that it's a little bit more compact. You have an extra sort of four inches there of space. Now, I'm one of these very rare individuals that would probably prefer the lens if it didn't have that feature because I find that sometimes to set it up just before I shoot, it can distract me a little bit. So it sort of just adds a second or two to the setup and if you forget to do that, it means that you might put the camera up to your face and then it's telling you to set the lens, blah, blah, blah. So I'll just see if the Robin stays there. Hello, Robin. Oh, he went, oh, little bastard. The lens has three simple switches. One to set automatic or manual focus. One for stabilization, which I presume also switches on the in-camera stabilization or IBIS. And another focus limiter, which I rarely use myself because sometimes I forget to switch this back and I end up not being able to focus on what I'm shooting. Sadly, there's no tripod collar. I rarely mount these lenses on tripods, but carrying the lens and camera by a tripod foot can be useful and it takes the pressure off the lens mount. The lens has a nice RF control ring built in, which is great to have. But when shooting birds, auto ISO is the norm. And on this lens, you're not gonna be changing aperture, obviously. So you could use this ring to change your shutter speed on the fly. But honestly, I haven't even touched this ring yet. I heard magpies going crazy and I knew there was something up. Turns out there was a fox there. Some finches, some linnets. If you're shooting with the RF800 on an R5, like I am here, remember that you have a 45 megapixel sensor at your disposal, so if the bird is quite far away and not taking up much of the frame, don't lose faith. That Sharp 800 lens will let you crop in quite a lot. The majority of these video clips I'm showing you here are shot in 4K at 120 frames per second on the R5. 
On the R5, when you press record whilst in photo mode, it'll start recording in the custom 3 setting, which is so handy, and I've obviously saved my custom 3 as 120 frames per second. So we've a lot of species there that I wouldn't have seen only for um, looking through the, um, the lens here. I see tufted duck, lapwing, there's a gull there as well. A big flock of lapwing. In regards to focusing on the RF800 lens, on my R5, the focus is very fast and responsive. Tracking is really impressive also, especially with birds in flight. Having come from using the EOS R with the Sigma 150-600, the RF800 on the R5 has been a huge step up for me. But having said that, there's lots of shots where the bird is slightly out of focus, even though the tracking was locked onto the bird. To give you an example, have a look at this hen harrier. The focus was actually locked onto the bird, so I thought I had perfectly sharp shots, but that wasn't the case. Only one or two of them were sharp. However, in most cases when the bird is against a clean background like a blue sky or something like that, it will be sharp and you can rely on it. Sometimes you'll want to opt for single point focus if the bird is stationary. With single point focus on a bird that's small in the frame, it can be hard to get precise focus on the bird. Sometimes manual focus for me is the only option. I just couldn't get the focus to lock onto this robin here. So I dialed in manual focus via the live preview. That way you can be sure that the bird will be perfectly in focus. If you were focusing manually on the RF800, the focus ring is quite large and relatively smooth in comparison to other telephoto lenses I've used. It's good to do a little bit of manual focusing here and there and not to rely on autofocus in every situation. Lately I found myself using autofocus a little bit too much and I noticed that on a few shots of particularly rare birds that were a good bit away, especially when the bird isn't flying against a clean background, the camera actually focused on the background and not the bird. Another thing I noticed with this lens is the minimum focus distance or lack of because it's quite long. Now having said that, the type of birds that I photograph, usually I'm not that close to them. But it did catch me out once or twice and I had to step back, like with this chaffinch here. Chromatic aberration or fringing can be seen towards the edge of the image on areas of higher contrast. But it's not that bad and easily corrected. And there's a bit of a vignette there which is to be expected. One of the things about the RF lens that you're probably wondering about is what is the depth of field like? What's the bokeh like? It is f11, so the term bokehlicious isn't exactly going to apply here. But to give you an idea of depth of field, I'm going to try and photograph the geese, which are about 100, 100 meters or so away from me here. Now, there's a wall about 35 meters in front of me here, and then the geese are 100 meters away, and then the cityscape is another four or five miles behind there. So this will give you an idea of sort of depth of field with an F11, okay? So let's try it. So I'll show you the city. So we have a tower there. I'll show you the wall. And then I'll show you the geese. <laughs> Hello. So what I'm gonna do just for the laugh is I'm gonna lift up the camera and we're gonna use the flippy screen here. And we're gonna get another little bit of height and see these bad boys. And we'll get the wall. Single point focus. Brent geese are a lovely bird. They're a beautiful looking bird and it's nice to capture them. So there's a woman here going past. She's about 220 meters from me and she's got mountains behind her and it's tracking her head nicely. And I'll just show you some video there as well. Okay, job done. Out of here. So just as I was leaving the area, another flock of Brent geese came in to feed, and it gave me an opportunity to get a cool photograph 
from behind. So other than the couple of hundred Brent geese, I'm not seeing a whole lot more stuff. Maybe I'll have to relocate. The lens doesn't come with a hood, so you'll need to purchase that separately for around 60 euros. Because the lens is fairly light, you will notice the extra weight of the hood. So if you want to keep your setup ultra light, maybe don't bother going for the hood because you may not always need it. It has a 95 mm thread, and it's a good idea in my opinion to buy a UV filter. Especially if you're lugging the lens around doing wildlife photography, it's good to protect that front element. Okay, so if you're interested in the RF 800 f11 lens from Canon, then chances are you've probably looked into other options as well. Now, I've only got this for the last, we'll say, two months, and up until then I've been shooting with this guy. This is the Sigma 150 to 600 contemporary lens. Now, these are really popular because they give you a lot of zoom power. They're very versatile. They're not that heavy, and they come in at a really good price as well. So currently, the Sigma contemporary lens is a very popular lens and in many ways it's a better choice than the RF 800. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try this 150 to 600 with the 1.4 extender on there as well and see how it compares to the RF 800 because currently with the 1.4 extender it's going to give you a zoom range of in or around 840 mil which is pretty close to the RF here so there's a bird here in the background so I'm just going to try a static shot and see what it's like Now these aren't the best bird photographs in the world to be using as a lens comparison. But bear in mind this was a dark gloomy day in the dead of winter and honestly these are very typical bird shots you'll get when you're starting out. Now if I line up these three shots together you can see the difference. The RF definitely produces a slightly sharper image but that also could be down to the focus system as well. The sharpness comes at the cost of an extra ISO of about 3000. We're going from an ISO of 2000 to an ISO of 5000 here, which is quite considerable. Here's another comparison between the RF800 and the Sigma with the standard Sigma 1.4X adapter. The RF is noticeably sharper. Interestingly though, when I drop the Sigma zoom back a bit to 750, it becomes a little bit sharper with the adapter. And you know, there's not as much in between these two photographs, but definitely you can see that the RF has a lot more detail, and that is one of the strong points of this lens. Here's a shot I took from where I was seated on the rock with the Sigma at 600. Now, I would consider this quite a good shot for a bird in flight with that lens at 600. Notice how it has a relatively decent blurred out background. This would be pretty hard to get with the RF800. And then shortly afterwards I took this shot with the RF800 of a red shank that flew past. The bird was flying a lot faster than the gull. Based on my experience, I think the RF did a better job than the Sigma would have for this shot. Perhaps it has a little bit more detail, but there's a couple of thousand more ISO. So you gotta ask yourself, do you want sharp shots with a high ISO or less sharp shots with a lower ISO? <laughs> Tough decision. One little tip I'd give anyone who's into bird photography is to always have the, the camera with you on the seat of the car if you're going from point to point. Don't, don't just put the camera in the bag. You know, if it's in your bag and you're walking and then you get into your car, take it out of your bag put it on the front seat and make sure it's actually on standby so that in the event you see anything from your car you can take a photograph now unfortunately I'm in Jen's car because my own car is in the garage so I don't have electric windows so that means I have to actually manually roll down the window now we already know that the RF 800 lens isn't exactly bocalicious and you're not going to get those creamy out of focus backgrounds but one thing I did notice, particularly in video, is that out-of-focus areas behind the subject had this slightly unsightly shimmering effect. Now, it's not that noticeable in photographs, but in a lot of video clips, I did see this kind of wavy movement, which looks a bit odd. 
As I said earlier in the video, the stabilisation in the RF800 is absolutely fantastic, especially on the R5 camera, which is the one I use. But 800mm isn't easy to stabilise, so you will see the stabilisation system compensate for your movements and the subject will sort of drift around in the frame. Sometimes when you're panning on a bird in flight, you will notice a sort of a jarring effect as the IBIS tries to counter your hand movements. I would say that if you're aiming for the best possible shots, do break out the tripod now and then. I shot some 8K footage of this whitetail sea eagle sitting in a tree as the sun set. I did it handheld, and to be honest, I really regretted not using the tripod for those shots. So with handheld video, it really works best if you're shooting in those high frame rates that will smoothen things out in post-production. It is absolutely freezing out this morning. Baltic. Thank God for nice hot tea. It's so tranquil here. I have this lovely open marshland here, bog land behind me here. The lake is there. I can see the mountains in Connemara over here. And I can see that they're snow capped. Not surprised, it's so cold. But despite all this beauty and tranquility around me, it's actually really quiet for birds this morning. So I'm, um, I'm looking through the scope here at a little bird, a little raptor called a merlin. It's Ireland's smallest species of falcon, Ireland's smallest raptor. And they're a very cute little bird. Now, the problem is he's very far away, but it's actually a she. So I'm looking out through the scope at about 40 or 50 magnification and the bird has only taken up a small amount of my view so um, I'll see if I can shoot what 8k kind of what kind of power 8k will give me the bird is there somewhere I think oh yeah I see it so there's the bird on 8k footage now and now what I'll do is I will switch over to, to uh, photography mode and see what we're like nice fast shutter speed here so I'll try and call it over all right so we've somebody going on holidays lucky bastards I wonder do these people on board this jet know that there's somebody standing in the middle of nowhere filming them in 8K? I would safely say that they don't give a shite. They're more interested in where they're going. Swans flying past. beginning to go low in the sky. I think it's about four o'clock, half four, and we're pretty much in the dead of winter, so I've very little light left. And, oh, we have some long tail tits here. Jesus. That was a surprise. Oh, come on, guys, please don't let me down. Ah. 
I'm at a huge ISO. I'm gonna slow down the shutter speed. A bit of view. Long tail tits are so cute. So let's have a look at some other tele zoom lenses for a Canon mount, be it EF or RF, across a broad price range. If money is no object and you want as much zoom power as possible, then you could go for the Canon 800 Prime. Now f5.6 isn't exactly a wide aperture in a standard lens, but at 800 it's crazy wide and will give you a lovely shallow depth of field, plus the extra speed that you need as well for birds in flight. But this lens weighs an absolute ton and you would want to be earning serious money from your photography to justify purchasing this lens which is going to cost you about 13,000 which is a lot of money. Now you could pretty much repeat exactly what I just said for the Canon EF600 f4 lens also priced around the same. It's big money for this lens but it is aimed at pros and as I said you'd want to be making a lot of money from your photography to justify buying it. So a year or two ago, Sigma released a 500 f4 lens, which was modestly priced at about six grand. Now this lens, for me, was very appealing because Sigma have a great build quality. It's gonna give you that lovely blown out background for birds, but the problem is you're going back down to 500. And 500 isn't exactly huge when you're photographing birds, unless you're in a hide. Now you could put an extender on that to give you more zoom power, but then again, you're gonna lose that lovely f4 aperture. If the Canon RF is a bit long in the zoom range, you could opt for its smaller brother, the RF 600. 600 is easier to use than 800 if you're new to bird photography. But again, with bird photography, you know, the birds usually only take up a small amount of the frame, so I would say stick with the 800. The RF 100 to 500 4.5 to 7.1 came out last year around the same time as the RF 800 and 600 and it was pretty well received as being a good lens as it's an L lens from Canon. It's a light and very versatile lens as well and it won't take up much room in your camera bag. And with that 100 to 500 versatile zoom range, it's a great all around zoom for general work, not just wildlife work. So this would be a very, very good lens if you've bought into the Canon RF system. But if you're a bird photographer, again, you're going back down to 500, but at 7.1 aperture at 500, it's getting a little bit dark again, especially if you were to consider using an extender, which is gonna bring you right up into a much narrower aperture, darker images. The updated Tamron 150 to 600, known as the G2, is quite a popular lens. Unlike Sigma that have brought out two versions of their 150 to 600, Tamron just have the one and it's priced sort of in between the two Sigma options. I do believe that this is quite a good lens. It probably pips the Sigma 150 to 600 in quality and I've seen a lot of people opt for this lens, so it's probably a good option. As I mentioned earlier, you cannot go wrong with the modestly priced Sigma 150 to 600 f5 to 6.3 zoom lens. This lens really was incredibly popular for Sigma. A lot of beginner and intermediate and even some pros use this zoom lens. It's very, very popular. It will get you good results and it's just a really good all-round zoom lens that's very versatile. So in general, I would say that this lens like this would probably be a better option. Now you can always get extenders for any of these lenses as well. With extenders, you know, you're going to reduce the aperture, you're going to have much higher ISOs and not as shallow a depth of field. So generally, I think it's better avoid extenders. But having said that, if you have a lens like the Sigma f4 500, a 2x extender is going to get you up to 1000 at f8. So that could be an option. So as you can see from the other options, there's not that much available that will compete with the RF 800 in the same price range. Very distant bird, what is that? Try and get into this field and see can I hide myself out somewhere and maybe not stand out like a sore thumb and possibly get a photo of something, anything. Oh God, this is getting deep. Trekking through this field now, it's almost like a paddy field. Oh. 
once again I'm stuck here now. There's a massive big trench separating these uh, fields. I guess they're used to, birds are used to seeing gates. That's not too bad. Now will that let me hide out a bit? Maybe we will. So if you've got this far into the video and you're wondering if I'd recommend this lens to you or not, then I would have to say that totally depends on your circumstances. Now, an f11 fixed aperture 800mm lens isn't really going to be suited for indoor use. And for sports outside, 800mm is probably a bit overkill. So primarily, this is a wildlife lens. But that doesn't mean you can't have fun with this lens for various other compositions. Just make sure that you're in an open space with lots of room around, like the seaside or something. I personally love telephoto lenses and the effects they give with the perceived image compression. You really can put together nice images with telephoto lenses. And I actually enjoy shooting with these type of lenses more than wide angle lenses. If like me, you're a bit of a bird watcher, bird photographer, who likes to go out on walks in the outdoors and doesn't want to bring a big heavy pro expensive lens, then I couldn't recommend this lens enough. The image is sharp, and combined with the new Canon mirrorless cameras, the focus is fast and very reliable. And then of course you have the stabilization. It's a lens that works best on a bright day for sure. And if you're hell bent on being a pro wildlife photographer, you will want something with a wider aperture that delivers brighter images with a shallower depth of field because blowing out the background is a very desirable effect when it comes to wildlife photography. But having said that, it's not entirely impossible with the RF 800. You just need to work on your compositions a bit more. So if you've liked the video you just watched folks, please give it a thumbs up and also leave a comment below and get involved in the conversation. If you want to get in touch with me, just check out my website, hughsweeney.tv and I'm on social media as well. You can get me at Films on Instagram and Hugh Sweeney Filmmaker on Facebook. So until the next video, folks, it's over and out for me and I'll see you. Take care. It's just too cold for birds. They're freezing their little balls off. <laughs>